40 years ago, experts estimated that only one child in every 5,000 had autism. Those pediatricians who'd ever heard of autism figured that it was so rare, they'd never see a single case in their careers. But today, autism has become extremely common. One child in every 68 is on the autism spectrum, and a lot of parents are panicked about the odds that their child might be next. I completely understand why parents are anxious and upset about autism, and it's because the number of diagnoses has been going up so much in the last 25 years or so, and parents have never been given an adequate explanation of why that's true. Award-winning journalist Steve Silberman is the author of Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity. He says when parents get no real answers, they'll often grab on to whatever's offered. You know, on one side, you have people saying that it's vaccines or pesticides or GMO or Wi-Fi or any number of other aspects of the modern world. And then on the other side, you have these kind of dry public health officials talking about broadened diagnostic criteria and better case finding. And it's not an adequate explanation for a young mother who is searching her two-year-old son's face for signs of eye contact. So parents feel that they have not been given the whole story, and that is true. In fact, our misunderstanding of autism goes back almost to its first description in the early 1940s by an influential psychologist named Leo Connor. Connor initially wrote that genetics were to blame, but then backed off. It was another step down the wrong road. What Connor did was, unfortunately, he changed his position and said, well, maybe there's some genetic contribution, but what really triggers autism is bad parenting and, you know, what ended up being called refrigerator mothers. So Connor ended up blaming parents, not just mothers, but mothers and fathers, for triggering autism in their children, and that created a tremendous burden of shame and stigma for families for obvious reasons. In fact, families were told not to talk about their children who are autistic. They were told to put the children in institutions for the children's own good and quietly remove their pictures from the family album. So the very impaired autistic kids in the 50s and 60s were put in institutions. Silberman says Connor convinced the world that autism was extremely rare, so rare that the disorder didn't seem worth looking into. So his theories went unchallenged for more than 30 years. But then in the uh, late 70s, there was a young cognitive psychologist in England named Lorna Wing, who had a profoundly autistic daughter named Susie. And she was asked by the National Health Service to do some research so that they could figure out proper allocation of resources for cognitively disabled children. So instead of waiting for autistic kids to come to her office, as Leo Connor had done, and on that basis speculate that autism was rare, Lorna and her research assistant, Judith Gould, went out into the suburb of London called Camberwell looking for children who displayed autistic behavior, and they found tons of them. That discovery seemed to validate competing theories about autism developed by the Austrian psychologist Hans Asperger, theories gathering dust since their development in Nazi Germany during World War II. Asperger discovered autism as a lifelong condition that lasts from birth to death and that encompasses a very broad range of manifestations from people who can't talk to people who will never be able to live independently to chatty astronomy professors. So in other words, Asperger's view of autism was very modern. You can go to Silicon Valley and find all of these undiagnosed people working quite successfully, developing software, working on hardware, and so forth. That's Dr. Barry Prezant, a professor in the Artists and Scientists as Partners Group at Brown University and author of Uniquely Human, A Different Way of Seeing Autism. I gave a talk at Google up in Cambridge, and the person who invited me came up to me after the talk and said, you know, not only is this useful in understanding autism, but it also helps me understand a lot of people here who don't have that diagnosis, who might be incredibly good in some areas, but socially might be a little bit off, or in some cases a little bit off-putting to other people who don't understand that honesty and that directness that we often see, especially in more verbal people with autism.
we know these people. It's the absent-minded professor in literature or, you know, other characters from literature who, who were clearly based on autistic people. However, it's important to say that just because someone's quirky or geeky or even just because someone has several autistic traits, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would ever need a diagnosis or want one or should have one. Like people say to me all the time, well, isn't Mark Zuckerberg autistic or, you know, wasn't Steve Jobs autistic? Well, I met Steve Jobs and I don't think he was autistic. I mean, he might have had autistic traits, but it's very, very important when considering the allocation of resources and research and services that we don't think that autism is just this mild condition that, you know, it's all it is is really being quirky because autism can be extremely disabling in the absence of adequate support. That's why when Wing found so many people with autism, she took her discovery and Hans Asperger's papers to a group of people who could do something about it. So then Lorna went to the subcommittee that was working on the so-called Bible of Psychiatry, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and said, we have to broaden the definition of autism because it's too narrow and families that need help are not getting it. She certainly knew what that was like because when her own daughter was diagnosed, her family was hardly able to get any help or resources. So she knew what it was like to not have access to special education classes and other resources. So she kind of behind the scenes swapped out Connor's criteria for Asperger's. And that happened in two stages in the late 80s and early 90s. And that's when the number of diagnoses started spiking and soaring. So it's not that suddenly so many more kids were developing autism because of some environmental factor. It's that the rules changed. Many children who wouldn't have been considered autistic under the old definitions now began being diagnosed. And Silberman says at the same time, something happened in pop culture that brought autism completely out of hiding. Very few people had ever seen an adult who they were told was autistic until 1988 when suddenly everyone in the world had seen one. And that was Dustin Hoffman's character of Raymond Babbitt in Rain Man. People do not realize how revolutionary Rain Man was because autistic adults were virtually invisible in media. Even many clinicians had never seen autistic adult. But even as autism became a household word, Prezant says a lot of what we learned was wrong. He says to a lot of school administrators, for example, a lot of autistic behaviors simply don't make sense. They don't understand what's behind things like flapping, rocking, and looking away. A lot of behavioral patterns in autism have been seen primarily as signs of pathology, that this is what is wrong. When you see a person jump up and down or flap or repeat speech, which is known as echolalia, a lot of patterns of behavior that is seen as autistic behavior, actually may be coping mechanisms to deal with a world that is overwhelming in some cases, overstimulating, noises are too loud, visual stimuli are too bright to deal with. And so we really see this as, in many cases, people with autism is trying to cope with, make sense of, and in some cases participate in interactions with other people and be able to learn more effectively in the world. Prezant says there's usually a reason behind a child's behaviors, if only we ask why and look at it from their perspective. For example, children with autism often have a very high energy level and have to release it somehow, so they may jump up and down. Here's another example. An area that I've done research in is known as echolalia, the tendency to repeat things either immediately or to repeat things that were heard previously. So some people with autism will repeat TV commercials or a conversation that mom and dad had at home the night before. And in the past, and even presently, some people consider that to be psychotic speech or meaningless parroting. Our research has demonstrated that it's a part of the language development process for many people with autism and may serve different purposes or functions. It may help a person take turns in conversation or it may help them say something again so they can process it better, like holding it in their mind the same way we will do that in our own minds, maybe not out loud. 
So there are many patterns of behavior in autism that have been pathologized. And it's not just that attitude, it's that what results from that attitude. And that is treatment approaches that try to rid an individual of those behaviors just with the goal of helping them look more quote-unquote normal. However, to a person with autism, what we think of as normal may be incredibly overstimulating, noisy, and chaotic. They have to cope somehow. Many of the things that people with autism are sensitive to and therefore may respond in ways we don't understand, we are sensitive to similar things, but we have better coping mechanisms. Whereas a person with autism, for example, who has limited ability to communicate that, they may try to bolt out of the room. Young kids may drop to the floor and start rolling on the floor, covering their ears. So we have many, many more if you will, skills in dealing with those challenges. But if schools are aiming simply for an orderly classroom, those behaviors may seem like the problem. Administrators may even think a child is willfully misbehaving and try to break them of it. And that can do far more harm than good. This is supported both by research and, even more importantly, what people with autism are now able to tell us. We are in a very unique circumstance compared to a decade or two ago in that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people with autism who have grown into adulthood who can now talk about their experience. And in many cases, they raise real concerns about treatments that they've received that did not understand their experience and treatments that in the long run not only did not help them, but in some cases caused more problem than good, such as post-traumatic stress reactions. Silberman says we need to explode the myths around autism and pay a lot more attention to understanding it. He says we're also doing a very poor job of finding out how people with autism could lead better lives in the community. We are not researching those things while we chase after risk factors either in the human genome or in the environment. The investment in research on autistic adults, which if you think about I mean, there are as many autistic adults as there are autistic kids. That's not just something I'm saying. That's been found in three major studies in the last five years or so. We are not looking at how to make those people's lives better, and we're pouring all this money on these kind of fishing expeditions looking for risk factors. So one of the things that my book is saying is that obsessing over what causes autism in a way, it's a form of denial because we're not dealing with the fact that there are many autistic people out there and their families that need help now. And all of that money, you know, that people think is going towards a cure is actually not helping them out. You can find out more about Steve Silberman's book, Neurotribes, and Dr. Barry Prezant's book, Uniquely Human, through links on our website, RadioHealthJournal.net. I'm Reed Pence. Many people are familiar with the term probiotics, but most don't understand the importance of knowing which strain of organism should be used for a specific condition. According to a survey conducted on behalf of VSL No. 3, more than half of people with irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, and ileal pouch say they don't know what to look for when choosing a probiotic. Dr. Patricia Raymond, as an expert gastroenterologist, what's your take? I encourage patients to look for probiotics backed by several studies, like VSL No. 3. For example, VSL No. 3 is a high-potency mix of eight specific live bacterial strains. And because the bacteria is live, this probiotic medical food is kept refrigerated behind the pharmacy counter to maintain its potency. There is strong support for VSL No. 3's benefit for the dietary management of UC, IBS, and ileal pouch. VSL No. 3 differs from other probiotics in that it is a medical food and must be used under medical supervision. So ask your doctor. Learn more at VSL3.com.